First, I want to welcome you all in the spirit of Alexander Coburn with a rousing response to the question, are we ready to greet the day with unbridled optimism? Yes. One more time, are we ready to greet the day with unbridled optimism? Yes. That's the spirit. That's what you would hear if Alexander ever came and stayed with you. phrases I picked up from Alexander, and I think lots of his friends did, was that hatred to be effective must be pure. <laughs> many, many years ago, Edward said, another dear friend and I were discussing Alexander, and Edward said to me, but Tariq, explain to me how he remains so steadfast. And I said, that's what he's like. The motivating thing in his life was politics, journalism, writing, and how to hit someone. He played a huge role in bringing a new layer of young people to the nation after he became a columnist there. And it was as a young journalist that I met him when I interned for him at The Nation several years ago. At the time, we were asked to rank our top choices of whom we wanted to work with, and of course, he was at the top of my list. He was a legend, and working with him on his column with its distinctive voice and incisive analysis was the opportunity of a lifetime. As the nation's associate publisher, Peter Rothberg, who was also an, an intern for Alex, put it, Alex took his intern seriously. He would ask us to suggest topics, not because he lacked any ideas, but because he wanted to involve us in the process. And when you wrote for Alex, Alex never asked you to soft pedal that. He never said, well, you know, that's the way it is. Just deal with it, get over it. Alex said, write it as you feel it. And he said, tell the stories about where you're from. Alex might have been the only white man in America that could get away with calling me boy. It's like, Kevy, old boy, bang it out. And, 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 and of course, and of course, um, Alex understood Southern culture. He understood this idea of white supremacy and empire. And I remember when I, when I burned the Confederate flag, Alex called me, Kevy, old boy, how did that go? Uh, one afternoon, he took us over to Quirk, the town nearby, uh, just to show us uh, sites of his early years and experiences. Uh, one of them was an old church. On the back wall of the church, Alex pointed to a slit in the wall way up high, and he said it was called the, the Leper's Peak. Uh, lepers weren't allowed in the church, but they were allowed to climb up on a ladder on the outside and peek in. And it kind of struck me that that would be a great title for Alex's next collection of essays. Uh, he uh, made sure that uh, his uh, targets in the establishment, who he eviscerated with such uh, verve and precision, would regard him as a very dangerous leper and one who's always peeking in, no matter how much they try to keep him out, and exposing what they're up to. And he did it in... Uh, remarkable way is actually one of the parts that I appreciated particularly was that he always did his homework, which is very rare and hard. Uh, so like uh, Tarek, the, uh, whatever journal he was writing in, the first article I'd turn to would be his, and it was always very informative. I learned important things and also flavored with uh, his unique uh, wit and style. Now, Heatherdown was the name of Alex's first public school in England. And um, the point, at this point in the story, he's pondering whether to go back to his old school 
ostensibly to make sure that Daisy is not in the hands of an incipient pornographer or other rude boys. Um, and so it goes like this. This is an extract. Um, the ground squelched wetly underfoot as I walked across Central Park, brooding about ground nuts, heather down, and the autumn reek of Berkshire bonfires. The idea of a quick return flight to yesterday, courtesy of transatlantic standby, was growing on me. If the premise of the voyage was commonplace in one respect, to see how exactly the child had become father to the man, there would be the unusual twist of being there as father of the child. Three days later, I was standing on Waterloo platform, just as I had with my mother over 30 years before. Daisy had been nervous of the idea, and I knew well her familiar fear. I would somehow make a fool of myself. Well, I'm going away to leave. Won't be back no more. Going back down south, child, don't you want to go? Woman, I'm trouble. I be all good night. Well, babe, I just can't be satisfied, and I just can't keep from Total calm. Those were the words um, my father said just as the brakes failed on his 1956 Chevy. <laughs> and we veered calmly off the freeway and up onto a grassy bank. <laughs> and <laughs> um, some others may have had similar exciting experiences. Um, and they were exciting. I was terrified and always screaming in alarm, but secretly very inspired by his ability to maintain total calm, humor, equanimity um, in extraordinarily terrifying circumstances. And I <coughs> had the um, luck to witness this over the last year when, of course, he was facing something very um, frightening. Uh, but his humor and courage and playfulness, lightness, was um, incredibly inspiring and uh, uplifting. was the one who was never cynical, never dwelling on destruction, always energetically pressing on to the future and delighting in new possibilities to build and cultivate, whether in the political, artistic, or culinary realms. He was a man who sprang out of bed every morning with eyebrows alert, ready to harvest the fruits of the day. He had a special interest in absolutely everything that was interesting, whether, as we've heard this today, tonight, Brecht, barbecue, plants, just any number of things. And the particular tailor-made conversations that you had with him really were just tailor-made for you. And he had equally erudite conversations with other people about completely different things that you knew nothing about. The McNeil Blair Report started in October of 1975 in the aftermath of Watergate. It was a show dedicated to the proposition that there are two sides to every question a valuable corrective in a period when the American people had finally decided that there were absolutely, definitely not two sides to every question. Back to Sunday school went the excited viewers to be instructed that reality, as conveyed to them by television, is not an exciting affair of crooked businessmen and lying politicians, but a serious continuum in which parties may disagree, but in which all involved are struggling manfully and disinterestedly for the public weal. 
narcotizing humorless properties of the McNeil Lara report familiar to anyone who has felt fatigue creep over him at 7.40 Eastern time are crucial to the show. Tedium is of the essence. Since the all but conscious design of the program is to project vacuous dithering, and now for another view of Hitler, <laughs> into the mind of the viewer until he is properly convinced that there is not one answer to the problem, but two or even three, and that since two answers are no better than none, he might as well not bother with the problem at all. Journalism career did not begin when he's <coughs> arrived on these shores. Um, many years of um, Ernest Sappings of the Foundation of Capital had gone on back in uh, England. He was a founder, along with the uh, late Miles Kington, of um, a journal uh, called Quintet. And this is just to show you that uh, the seed was planted long ago, at the age of, in this case, the age of 17. This was Alexander's manifesto for the second edition. Vulture, large vulture. You can see what the vulture is saying. Everything from his cynical beak to his capitalist belly shouts out, no trouble this year, I hope. None of this preoccupation with cleverness and impressions. Good, solid Yorkshire pudding, that's what we want. Well, we do our best, but there are obstacles in our path. This noble bird offers you the attitudes and behavior of a being we have yet to encounter, the average Glenarmon boy, distilled in the form of a Gallup poll. Proudly, it presents articles on holiday life and articles on our cultural heritage. Ramble with Greenfly through nature's byways, or ride the golden chariot with our poets. Do not hesitate. Take wings with the vulture. Alexander was always convinced that the powers that be are far more vulnerable to criticism than they pretend. Our father once uh, said that the report that God was on the side of the big battalions was propaganda put out by big battalion commanders to demoralize their opponents. On the contrary, both he and Alexander believed they could be harried effectively by journalistic guerrilla warfare. And it's this belief in the effectiveness of the individual that was so much at the center of Alexander's life and writings, and which I hope will long survive him. Thank you. Something that could make you do wrong, make you do 